but the first time I turned the sound on after having graded that sequence, you know, the, the, that there's one shot in that that I love. Denise's shot is the shot where he, it's, it's from behind Paul and he stands up and it's just him just getting air as he stands up from behind. My favourite shot's the next one where we're profile with him. It's almost like we're riding another sandworm. That's our theory, yeah. like a tracking sandworm, let's call it. <laughs> with, a, with a long lens and we're tracking with him as he stands up and there's amazing Zimmer beat like there's an amazing Zimmer kind of music punch that that absolutely is mind blowing and I and I punch the air every time that happens like every time I see that in the cinema which is now a dozen times I'm like yeah go tall that's amazing Hey, Greg, thank you so much for sharing your time with us on the movie podcast today. Happy to always talk about this amazing movie. I've been I've been so excited about this film since I graded it, you know, a few months ago and saw it in IMAX for the first time. And I've kind of had to keep my mouth shut because the only person I can people I can talk to about it has been the um uh about my collaborators, you know, the my designer and director and VFX supervisor of my crew. So the fact that I could talk to you guys about it's pretty cool. Congratulations once again on Dune Part 2. It, it truly is a masterwork. We are just completely blown away by it. And we, we've seen it twice now. I'm, I'm excited that you have seen it twice. Have you seen it in IMAX? What, have you seen it? Both, Both times. times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's cool, isn't it? It's very, very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. We have to ask you, of course, you're reteaming with the knee on Dune Part 2. Uh, we'd love if you could talk to us about your chemistry with one another and how you wanted to approach doing a sequel to Dune. It's a great question because we talked at length about what number two was going to be. You know, and we, when we realized that it was going to happen, because of course you never really want to, I don't know, in the film business it's, it's tricky. You don't want to plan, uh, plan unknowns. You know, when things aren't, 100% confirmed. You kind of want to talk in code. You don't really, it's a, I don't know, I'm not superstitious, but it's a it's a weird thing where you don't really want to talk about a part two. When it started to become a reality, we started to talk about it seriously and go, right, well, how are we going to do this? And, you know, I think that that's where the rubber kind of hits the road, where, where you know, up to that point, we never really had to shoot a sad one and writing sequence. Like, we never really had to kind of do all these things. We never really had to sit a siege. Like, we... We we're like, well, we're not seeing the siege. We don't have to solve that problem. Um, but then, when part two became a reality, we went, okay, here's the reality. Okay, we have to, we have to steer Leah. We have to, you know, we have to, you know, ride with Samwer. We have to attack, uh, you know, we have to attack the emperor using <laughs> sandworms. I mean, it's like, how the hell do we do that? And um, that was the time where we started to get real about, okay, how do we actually do this? And and um and what what techniques will we use you know the the fan when i'm writing sequence was probably one of the first things we tackled because clearly he paul has to learn how to ride a sandworm and we couldn't do it we couldn't shoot it the same way that we shot the sandworm riding on part one which was on a long lens a long way away you know the frame at the end of the movie so we acknowledged that 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 was successful but we couldn't do that with paul we had to be with paul so we started to map out, you know, what that would look like and, and how we would actually go about shooting that. And, you know, we couldn't really find reference of any other sandworm writing. So, you know, we looked at a myriad of things. We looked at water skiing videos, skiing videos. Um, we looked at surfing videos, like, you know, the, tons of these references that I pulled out and said, all right, how do we shoot a surfer? How do we shoot a, a water skier? How do we, you know, how do we do these things? How do we shoot a skier and be with them? And, um, we came up with a plan. We came up with a strategy, and it's so funny, isn't it? Like, I love that sequence, and I and I and I've seen the edit, of course, a thousand times because I graded it. And, you know, but but it, when I grade it, I don't normally grade with sound or music. I grade without that because it, you know, I can focus on the on the images. But the first, but the first time I turned the sound on after having graded that sequence, you know, that the, that there's one shot in that that I love. Denise's shot is the shot where he, it's it's from behind Paul and he stands up. And it's just him just getting air as he stands up from behind. My favorite shot's the next one where we're profile with him. It's almost like we're riding another sandworm. That's our theory, yeah. like a tracking sandworm, let's call it, <laughs> with, a, with a long lens. And we're tracking with him as he stands up. And there's an amazing Zimmer beat. Like there's an amazing Zimmer kind of music punch that, that absolutely is mind-blowing. 
And I and I punch the air every time that happens. Like every time I see that in the cinema, which is now a dozen times, I'm like, yeah, go tall. That's amazing. And recreating that scene, we got to talk about IMAX. It plays a huge role in Doom Part 2, especially during the opening sequence when it's immersing you into Arrakis. And just the aspect ratio alone, did it help you tell a more immersive story? Well, we, you know, we, we discovered... We knew we wanted to be an IMAX even on part one, obviously, because we knew that we wanted to tell Paul's story through through an expanded world. We wanted to open his world, you know, and, and the same way that people have expressed, um, you know, people going to a new location for the first time and opening their world, we wanted to do that with a format and we could do that with IMAX. And so we decided that on part two, like the film for the most part is an immersion and there's a lot of action and there's a lot of immersion. And we loved how the scene on part one played. You know, the the where the, the rescue from the, the 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 spice harvester of you know where where Paul almost gets sucked in and they fly out over it. We loved the way that played out in IMAX. For us, that was I think that exceeded our expectations of IMAX. You know, I think for us that we went ah, oh, that's a really successful scene, and it, for us we loved it as film nerds. We just loved the way that played out. And so we went, well, listen, this film starts with an action sequence, you know, and but it, but it then cuts into to, to a lot of drama with these, with these actors. And so we went, well, I, I think we can play most of this movie in 4.3 or a lot of this movie in 4.3 and then, you know, a bit of one one nine oh. So it became like, well, why not do the whole film like that? And and we did and, and I, I, I don't know, I, I, I think it was the right call because... Like you said, it becomes immersive, and it's an incredible experience, IMAX, because they 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 push this idea of immersion, and it is absolutely true. And you get into the action, you get into the drama, you get into the love story, you get into all the minutia of the of the filmmaking through IMAX, and or through it's through an immersive larger format, you know. Yeah, no, it, it 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 absolutely does, and you know, and I'm also thinking about that sequence where we get introduced to Austin Butler's character Fade Rothrod during that Coliseum battle on Getty Prime, and we're almost introduced to a more monochromatic color scheme. What went behind building the look of those scenes? Well, so so that's an interesting one because did anyone was, uh, you know, um, as you know, the 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 June Part One had a had a really successful award season, which was which was fantastic, but it was also, you know, it meant that we were um our prep was littered with events and and other things. So Denise was writing but in between, you know, events. Um and he came to me, I think, one day and said, Hey, listen, I've got I'm 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 in the process of writing the 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 the, the fade battle. And he said, you know, because I want to, I, you know, the sun on getting prime has to be different to the sun on Arrakis because we're going from one to the other and we're outside, you know, and, and how do we make it different? And then he said, like, should we make it black and white? Is the sun different? Is it, this, is it that there? And, and I was like, Denise, I've got the perfect solution. I've been playing with infrared on digital cameras for the last sort of 10 years from Zero Dark 30, actually, when I was lighting with infrared light. And, you know, I'd used it a few times for, for VFX passes on Rogue One and, and I did a test and said to him, we can get rid of all the visible light and shoot just with infrared light. And this is what it does to skin tones, what it does to the pupils, to the iris. You know, I said, well, potentially we could shoot this thing inside and everybody looks like they're in the dark, but we can see them clearly, you know. And we tested that um, and that wasn't as interesting as us being outside in the real sun um, and and seeing what it does to the to the Harkonnen, but for me, what's great about that is that it actually shows if you understand that in in Getty Prime you, you don't see visible light, you only got this kind of this infrared glow off everybody. You kind of understand why they look the way they look. You know, you understand why they why, why they have no hair and why they're so pale. Like you kind of get it that there's no sun in Getty Prime. The, the sun is like an anti sun. It's a black sun. So yeah, you kind of get that. So I don't know. It was a, it was a fun, interesting te- uh, testing process to get to that point. And it looks visually stunning. And obviously, seeing it in IMAX and really changing the feel of the film. And we're getting introduced to Austin Butler's character, who was just terrifying in this. So 
it was a really cool way to introduce him. Yeah, thanks. I'm really pleased that I got to be better use this this infrared thing that I've been playing with. You know, because it, yeah, I haven't really used it to that effect before. So it was a bit, to me, it seemed like the perfect soul to Denise's great idea of this kind of sun that doesn't have any color thing. Definitely. And I was like, perfect. Here we go. <laughs> we, can do it, we can do it. We can do it literally. We can do it literally where the camera can't record the color because right. there is no yeah. color. It can just record infrared. You obviously have a strong connection with the cast filming Doom Part 1, Part 2. You have an unbelievable bond with Josh Brolin. You've collaborated with one another to create Dune exposures. Can you tell us how that came to be? So, you know, Denny asked me super early during the prep process if I'd be interested in just taking some photos because, you know, I'm an ex-photographer and, you know, he'd seen some of the photos that I've been taking, you know, on my film camera. And I was just noodling around with things. And, you know, I've done some... I haven't worked as a professional photographer in a number of years because I've been too busy. But um, so he, he said to me, he goes, like, do you want to capture and record the making of June? Because I love your photographs and I'd love to have your photographs record this process. And my first reply back was, well, I mean, listen, I'm really worried about doing a good job on this. Like this, this to me is I have to succeed at June and, you know, June and I, yeah, you, you know, I said, I'll do it. But only if it's not for any PR or it's any publishing. I'm not thinking about documenting the process. There's no, there's no conscious need for me to take photos. Like I'm not doing it for any reason whatsoever. And he was like, "Yeah, cool." I said, "He said, you know, if we end up with a couple of shots at the end for our coffee table, for our, you know, whatever." So I did it, and and I started shooting some really great stuff. And I found it to be a really interesting process where. It meant that I could step back from a scene and not see the scene the way I would ordinarily see it. And, and I actually think it helped me um, understand the light and the scene. Uh, instead of distracting me, it actually helped me, believe it or not. And um, along the way, you know, um, I, I showed a few people on set as we went along and I showed, you know, Brolin and because, you know, he, he's, he's, I was reading some amazing stuff he was writing on Instagram. And I was coming to work the next day and going, dude, when did you write that thing? Like, it's amazing. Because I'm a strong fan of um, literature and beautiful writing. And he, he is an amazing writer. So we kind of riffed on each other's work for a while. And then Tanya, who's who's the EP um, and producer on the movie, kind of recommended and said, hey, why don't you guys do a, do a, you know, a thing together? And so there you go. That, that was how it started. And you know what? I love it because what it means is the photography is not defined by just the photography. It's defined by as much by the words that accompany it as it does a, by the by the by the images. And it made me realize what it is I love about filmmaking, which is my images do not stand alone by themselves. They are they are improved and enhanced by by people who are skilled in other areas. Like that that Hans Zimmer example I gave you before. Like that shot of Paul standing up. It's a great shot. I will say I'd love it by itself. But it wasn't until I saw the, the Zimmer power and in conjunction with Joe Walker's edit, in conjunction with Denise's direction, that I just went fist pump, you know, air pump. Like that. So it's those things where you go, Josh's words, I think, enhance my photography and hopefully my photography enhance his words together. So it's a team thing. That's what I love about filmmaking. It truly is, Greg. We are so grateful for your time. You are absolutely incredible. We cannot wait to see what you get to work on next. Uh, we're such big fans of ours. You already know. Thank you so much again. And I really hope we can talk soon. No, thanks, guys. Awesome to chat to you. Really fun. Really fun. <laughs>